can't sleep, I reach for Malthus. Or as I prefer to think of him, the Reverend T.R. Morpheus. Still warm. Two brandies. Hmm? Yes, sir. The natural tendency of mankind is to reproduce. Humans can double their numbers every 25 years. But they don't. A struggle for resources slows growth, and death and disease, war and famine check the population. I know the argument. Yes, but don't you see exactly the same struggle takes place throughout nature? I don't know why I didn't make the connection before. Why are we not overrun with insects and frogs? Well, given the rate at which they reproduce the number of eggs produced by each and every female. Nature's broom sweeps away the ugly ducklings, the runts. Yes, yes, but it's not that simple. <coughs> it's not that simple. Sometimes it's the ugly ducklings that are better adapted to the situations of life. They have longer legs and can run faster. They have bigger beaks that can crack harder nuts and seeds in harsh winters. They survive, have more offspring. Nature selects them to pass on their traits to future generations. And where do we fit in? Well, the sun does not revolve around the earth. Nature does not revolve around man. Man must fall into nature's cauldron. He's no deity, no exception. Once you accept that species can pass into one another, the whole fabric totters and falls. They'll burn you at the stake for this. Yes. But now you have a theory. So I said, don't come down the ladder, Mother. I've taken it away. Good evening. Darwin's work began with the observation that individuals differ from each other. And these minute differences, Darwin believed, might be advantageous. It might give each individual an edge when it came to getting food or finding a place to survive in nature. Darwin realized that in nature, individual organisms compete for limited resources. Those with some kind of advantage, in coloration, for example, or in speed, or in vision, are more likely to survive and reproduce, and pass on these advantages to their offspring. Those who are less fit will not succeed. Darwin called it natural selection because the forces of nature select which organisms will survive. The survivors will be those whose variation fortuitously adapts them better to changing local environments. And then because they pass on those traits to their offspring, the population changes. That's natural selection, that's all it is. It's not a principle of progress. It's just a principle of local adaptation. You don't make better creatures in any cosmic sense should make creatures that are better suited to the changing climates of their local habitats. That's it. Darwin couldn't actually see natural selection acting in real time. But today, scientists can, by observing the evolution of HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. Jeff Gustafson has been infected with HIV for over a decade. He takes a host of medications, but to little avail. The virus keeps adapting, evolving into new strains that evade the drugs. There's a pervasive feeling that all you have to do is take your medicine and you'll be okay, and that really isn't the case. You know, HIV has the capacity to evolve no matter what you give it. There are 19 HIV drugs on the market today, and of those 19, I've already been through 14 of them. Clarence Johnson, too, is locked in a daily struggle against the rapidly evolving virus. Sometimes I feel like I'm fighting a losing battle. I haven't given up yet, but there have been times that I just want to just lay down and give up. But um, I can't leave my family behind. <laughs> 
Clarence Johnson's doctor, Michael Sag, has seen HIV evolve into new varieties over the last dozen years. The virus is constantly changing, subject to the forces of natural selection in the environment of a patient's body. Imagine we didn't have the concept of evolution, and we started giving drugs to patients that in the test tube looked great, and all of a sudden, the virus starts coming back, and it's not susceptible to the drugs anymore. What a mystery. How in the world did that happen? There's only one way that it happened, through evolution. Once inside a patient's white blood cells, HIV replicates at an alarming rate. Billions of new viruses are spawned every day. And each time it reproduces, random genetic copying mistakes, mutations, result in slightly different varieties of the virus bursting forth into the bloodstream. Some of these new varieties, just by chance, will have traits that make them resistant to certain drugs. So when drugs enter the bloodstream, natural selection favors the drug-resistant forms. They survive and reproduce. Before long, drug-resistant viruses dominate in the patient's body. Evolution seems pretty easy to understand when we look at big animals. We can kind of see it, in a sense. But that's evolution that took centuries to develop. When you're talking about something like a virus that you can't see in everyday life, it's hard to imagine how it changes. In the case of HIV, we're talking about minutes to hours to move from one species to another. It's mind-boggling in terms of the speed with which HIV can replicate. Clarence? How are you feeling overall? I'm doing okay. Great, doing okay. Doing Every time I so, see a patient, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what is the virus doing in the environment of that patient? The virus is producing itself on the order of billions of copies a day. Those few that happen to be able to work in the presence of drug say, hey, this is my chance, and they emerge. So it creates the appearance that the virus has thought this through, but in fact, it's just a matter of chance. It's a matter of a virus being there that's not susceptible to the drugs. It emerges, and the virus begins to win the war. That's just what happened to Jeff Gustafson. Each time he tried a new drug, the virus evolved to resist it. Even a cocktail of multiple drugs made little difference. Here's this puny little virus that doesn't have a brain, and yet it can outwit some of the top scientists in the world. All the, the virus has going for it is it, it can't copy itself too well. I mean, that's pretty awe-inspiring and scary. All that happens in evolution, at least under Darwinian natural selection, is that organisms are struggling in some metaphorical and unconscious sense for reproductive success, however it happens. The process of natural selection feeds on randomness, it feeds on accident and contingency, and it gradually improves the fit between whatever organisms there are and the environment in which they're being selected. But there's no predictability about what particular accidents are going to be exploited in this process.